welcome to the Libertarian Alliance. Uh, we meet every uh, month, usually the uh, third Tuesday of the month, at seven, uh, it's half past seven. And uh, today we have uh, Tristy and Michelle speaking on the culture wars are the new class war and why you have to take sides in them. And with that, I'll hand it over to Tristy. Thank you very much, David, and thank you all for coming. I know there was intense competition from football and from the sun, uh, but uh, so I'm all the more pleased that, that um, you are here in, in big numbers. I mean, um, so um, it's very uh, gratifying. Um, I want to start uh, that little talk with a, an assertion by a political philosopher um, with the name of Carl Schmitt. And Carl Schmitt said, the purpose of politics is to create an enemy. And Carl Schmitt was, of course, had a flirtation with the uh, National Socialist Party in the 1930s. And then he backed away, or rather they expelled him, uh, which saves Carl Schmitt's reputation later on. But um, this um, affirmation that the purpose of politics is to create an enemy is something that actually has been used by people on the left, has been used by people on the far right. Um, there must be an element of truth in it. And, and there is. And what I want to say is precisely when we will be talking about culture wars and when we will be talking about uh, what, what, what happened during the Cold War, I would like you to keep in mind that this is um, the function of politics. It is to create an enemy. And you understand this easily if uh, we simply take a dictionary definition of politics. Dictionary definition of politics tells us that politics is simply um, the use of government, the influence that people have on government, uh, on its apparatus, on the police, on the... Uh, taxation, uh, on the instruments of repression, on education, on all these things from prisons to roads that a government is in charge of. And a government, and this is a classical, a canonical definition of a uh, state, uh, a government or a state, I confuse the two words, um, a canonical definition is Max Weber's definition that a state is um, the instrument, is the organization that exercises a monopoly of violence, legitimate violence, on a, a given territory, over a given territory. Now, if politics is about creating an enemy, it is creating an enemy against which that violence, that state violence, that government violence, is going to be directed. And it works both ways. So in other words, the government will use the enemy in order to justify the imposition of violence, in order to justify its own government's existence. And conversely, constructing an enemy will be a, a, a way to uh, rally people around the government. So it works in many different ways. And that has been what politics, um, the function of politics, the essence of politics for the last, ever since politics existed. In other words, ever since the Neolithic age when you started to have the first governments. Um, the machinery of repression. Um, what I would like then to offer is two options. Either we accept that definition, we accept what Schmidt is saying, we accept the logic, the coherence of a society where one organization is using violence in a non-punished way, in a legitimate way. We accept it. That is what people have done for thousands of years, and we question it, but we only question who exercises that violence. We don't question the fact that violence is exercised at all. 
the, probably many people in this room, I mean, I know many among you, um, will disagree with the fact that we can accept the um, legitimacy of violence against innocents. Violence against people who are not criminals or violence against people that the state has designated as criminals. They are only criminals because they are the enemy, because they have been targeted, they have been identified as the enemy. If we disagree with this, um, then we have a problem. Because what it means in a definition of sort of politics and so on is that if I control the process, the political process, if me and my group, my friends, my lobby, my uh, majority, if we control the political process and I don't like you, I may shut you up, I may arrest you, I may deport you, I may exile you, exile you, ostracize you, tax you, conscript you. That is how we use politics. That is how we use, we instrumentalize government. If we reject Smith, uh, Smith, uh, Carl Schmitt's uh, vision, if we believe that there is no justification for violence that is exerted, violence that is directed at innocence, then we lean towards another option, which is a kind of libertarian society, a kind of society which many libertarians have called a private law society, a society where there doesn't exist a justification for uh, violence. How do we define a private law society? How do we define a libertarian society? Well, just by one thing. It's a society where there is no enemy. A libertarian society is a society that has completely discarded, ejected the notion of an enemy. And there is a corollary. Because if politics is constructing an enemy, and a libertarian society is a society that declares we have no enemy, then a libertarian society is a society where there is no politics. Now, it doesn't mean in a private law society that everybody is an angel, that everybody lives in a kind of uh, divine harmony with all other people. Not at all. There are people who are criminals. They are thieves. They are rapists. They are murderers. They are patho pathological serial killers. They are bad people. They are simply people we don't like. They are people who sleep with our spouse. They are people who, um, I don't know, uh, don't like the music we like and so on. We are not all friends, but we don't have enemies. And that distinction between enemies and people we don't like, enemies and criminals, is one that structures politics. And it's one precisely where, if you exclude enemy, you have a society where politics is itself excluded. In such a private law society, another aspect is that there is no longer a differentiation between ends and means. The ends and the means in a private law society are conflated. You don't become a, or you don't create a global project in the future. Uh, you simply have people who are autonomous, individuals, persons who decide on their lives what they want to do, what their personal project for flourishing are going to be, and they decide this with other people that want to join that project. So there isn't a future of a country because there isn't a country. There are communities, there are families, there are groups, 
There are associations, organizations, corporations, whatever. But there isn't such thing as a country because a country is precisely something that is defined by the existence of a state. And the future is simply what people will want to be, will want to make of themselves. And again, it's not that we are people who appear on this earth, who are thrown into this earth um, without a baggage. We come from a family, we have a culture, we have um, a society behind us, a community behind us that has given us a culture. I mean, I speak a language which is not Chinese. I come from a city, Paris, which is not London or St. Petersburg. But all this that we have, which makes us human beings, is what gives us the means precisely to construct our identity, gives us the means to choose the people that we want to be living with, as opposed to being inside a political order that assigns us position and tells us this is the way we want you to live. Now, when I say this is the way we want you to live, that what well, is government that tells you? Government tells you this is who you are, this is who are your enemies, if there is a war we will conscript you, we will send you in the trenches, you may be killed, you may be bombed, as people are bombed today in many parts of the world, uh, you will suffer all this because you are a citizen of this country. Now, that is political power. And it's a private law society, a libertarian society, is not a society where there is no power at all. But it is important to understand that there are differences between types of power. And one type of power that exists in this society, and will be the only type of power that exists in a private law society, is the power to be of service. It is the power to render a service. I mean, the woman I love, if she asks me, come at five o'clock and fetch me at Gatwick, I will go. I won't go for anyone else. Uh, if someone employs me and tells me, look, we are going to pay you 100,000 pounds a year, and you are going to be at the office every morning at 7 o'clock, and you are going to do this, and you are going to do that, I will do it. I will do it because they render me a service, such as pay me 100,000 quid a year. That, to me, is an important service. It may not be for somebody else. The power to render a service is limited by one thing only which is when the service is no longer rendered, the power stops. If they don't pay me 100,000 quid, I don't go at 7 o'clock in the morning to their offices. Political power is a power of coercion. It's a power without reciprocity. The chap who's the border police who stopped me at Heathrow the other day and told me to open my suitcase and to show my identity documents and so on, he was not rendering me any service. If I had to pay him, I would pay him to stay at home and play golf. That is how useful he is to me. That is how useful most of the people who work in government are to you. Because if they were useful to you, you would be happily paying them. They wouldn't need to force you, to constrain you, under threat of arms. Because if you don't pay your taxes, if you don't join the army when you are conscripted, if you don't do all these things, very bad events are going to come to you. Like someone man armed and threatening, knocking on your door at five o'clock in the morning and taking you in a black car to a place where you don't want to go. So the limit of political power is simply the death of its victims. That is how far it goes, ultimately. The surest way 
to create an enemy and therefore to have politics is to manipulate a mental disorder that exists in human beings and that is psychosis. If psychosis is an impaired relationship that we have with reality, that is, again, a dictionary, a medical dictionary definition of what psychosis is. I believe my house is haunted. I believe that MI5 has implanted in my brain a chip and controls my movements. That is the sort of delusion that some people have, and it's a medical condition. But when it's no longer a medical condition, is when that delusion is shared by thousands of people, by millions of people. Then that delusion is reinforced. It becomes something that you don't question because, hey, everybody believes it. How could you not believe it? And many of these things, of course, have been around us, these collective delusions, tribes, societies believing that they are spirits in that forest and you don't want to go there. More sinister, you had societies believing that certain human beings have it in their nature to be slaves. Aristotle believed that. It is in the nature of human beings to be slaves. Um, it is in the nature of women to be less intelligent, less fit for intellectual pursuits than men. Certain of these delusions have given societies an, av an advantage. For instance, um, a very interesting little anecdote that Michel de Montaigne, in his essays, write, and especially um, in an essay called Cannibals. And it's just a little vignette. He says that the Portuguese had taken from their colonies um, a few sort of um, autochthonous uh, people from the early settlers there, called them Indians, if you want, um, and brought them to around Europe. And they came to Rouen. And Montaigne sat down with a translator with them and said, what is striking you? I mean, you were living in the Amazonian forest. What is striking you in Rouen? And Montaigne said, what has struck us is that there was a young child surrounded by big, muscular, bearded men in arms and the young child was giving them orders. The king of France was a young child. Now, that, of course, is something to them that would be unthinkable. But these are the sort of delusions or this sort of, sort of thing. There is, a person, there is a person that is a king. And we obey the king. We, you have these sort of delusions that says, God is with us. God mitunz. God is with us. And of course, if it is a rallying cry, the belief in this will give you a competitive advantage in war because, hey, you won't be killed. Hey, God it will help you triumph of his infidels and, and so on. But they are, unfortunately, delusions that are quite tragic. And history has shown us that. All these people, these millions of men and women and civilians and children who have died believing that they were fighting for their God, that they were fighting for the empire, the Roman Empire. Where is the Roman Empire today? They were fighting in 1914 for the British Empire. Millions died in the trenches. Where is the British Empire? Where is the USSR that 
you know, people were ready to nuke the planet, either to defend the USSR or to fight the USSR. Gone. I mean, so many people have died for cloth. Wind made visible, which is what we call a flag. People have erected idols and still do and sacrificed their children and sacrificed themselves for that. And that is a question. Do we accept a sacrificial society? Do we accept a society where there is some collective, there is some higher ideal to which we should immolate our lives and the lives of the people we love. And you have to take sides. You have to decide, yes, it's right. We should do it. We ought to do it. We ought to die for this. Or you say, no, um, I don't believe in that. I believe that human beings have a destiny that they can follow and that is their path and it's not imposed on them by others. That is the culture war. And that is marking, that is tracing a line between two groups. One group, one sort of philosophy is a philosophy that is derived from the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment in the 18th century was that moment when people started questioning the forms and the carriers of authority, tradition, superstitions, prejudice, myths. They wanted to test everything through reason, and experiment. Let's say it is Adam Smith's worldview. Adam Smith is someone who made many mistakes in his analysis of society and so on, but he had one thing going for him. He said self-interest is um, a driving force. Self-interest is an important natural resource. And of course, there is another um, strain in the Enlightenment, which is sort of scientism and things like that. But that has been losing a lot of track with the demise of the Soviet Union. So I will keep only the vision of Adam Smith's sort of um, analysis that we follow our self-interest, and it is a good thing that we do. It is the invisible hand. It is actually the hand of providence, if you believe in that. Why do we act? We act in our self-interest, which is not necessarily monetary. It's not necessarily that we are paid for it, but we gain a material reward. I'm not here because David is giving me 100 pounds. I'm here because I enjoy it. It is in my self-interest. And there is another group of followers in the Enlightenment. The socialist, the Marxist especially the Marxist socialist. I mean, Marx was a keen reader of Adam Smith. And he took from Adam Smith, Adam Smith's daftest idea of the labor theory of value. But let's forget that. Marx believed, exactly like capitalists and so on, that we are victims, some people, not we, all of us precisely, but some people, a majority of people, are victim of exploitation. And there is no reason for it. There is no reason for this exploitation. There is no divinity that orders it. There is no tradition, nation, and so on, that says that we should be exploited. And because Marx missed the real protagonist in this class struggle, because of the sort of wrong vision, uh, wrong understanding of the labor theory of value. He said that the people who are exploited are the workers, the employees, the wage earners. 
And the class of exploiters are the capitalists. Now, for libertarians, I wrote a paper on this, many people did, and so on. No, the class struggle is between producers, and that includes the owners of capital, and the workers, on the one hand, and state employees. A class of state employees who racket, take, don't even um, pay, they simply take through taxation, conscription, confiscation, all these violent means, what they want. And they act as a class, they have a solidarity of class, they have a solidarity of class across countries. I mean, today, the Germans, Merkel and Macron, are sitting together to say we should have the same tax rate across Europe. Now, imagine two corporations, five corporations, sitting in a room and saying we will impose the same prices on all our automobiles and stop competition between us. That is what they do. They operate as a class. Cartel. Now, sorry? Cartel. Yeah, the cartel. It is a cartel. It's illegal. Well, it would be illegal if it were not for the state. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> now, what is interesting is that these two classes whether they are, well, however you define it, whether it's Marx or whether it's the definition I've just given you, are driven by interest. They want to stop exploitation. And when you are driven by interest, there is always something to negotiate. And this is what capitalists have done. Faced with the rise of socialism, the capitalist class has said, when 1870, 1880, Bismarck was the first head of state who said, socialism is real. It's not a bunch of crackpot idealists who uh, are, you know, sort of doing their things and so on. No, no, no. That is dangerous. We have to stop that. And how do we do it? We throw money at them. Let's have a welfare state. And then in 1917, after the storming of the Winter Palace, the people with money, the capitalists, went to the people with guns, the state, and said, you have to stop this. Tax us. Pay them. And in 1945, when the Soviets were on the Rhine, well, on Yelp, 300 kilometers from the Rhine, all the capitalists in America and so on said, throw money at them. NHS, pension, um, all these things. Pay them, pay them, minimum wages, everything. And of course, what happened recently is that with the demise of the Soviet Union, there is no revolution on the horizon. We have paid them. Because interests are negotiable. But it's something different that happens when you have the other, um, the other sort of way of looking at it. I was think, just thinking at one thing. We are in June, and it's the anniversary of uh, <clears throat> the end of a general strike in May 68. I mean, when you had in France, I was living there, when you had in France for three weeks, a general strike by all the employees, electricity only two hours a day. You had no transportation, no metro, no buses, no airlines, no airports, no nothing. I remember military lorries bringing food to Paris. And the revolution didn't take place because the government said, let's sit and talk. And both sides these sort of fierce people who had built barricades and things like that, and the capitalist said, let's talk. 
let's sit down. And that is what we did with the Soviet Union, in a way. The Soviet Union um, actually had to appeal to, uh, sorry, I'll talk about this later. Because what I wanted to say now is that interests ignore nations. It ignores all these sort of things. Um, it's simply people. And in that way, Marx and the capitalists are cosmopolitans. They are universalists. Uh, the Soviet Union was the only country that never had a geographical location in its name. The Union of Republic, Socialist Soviet Republic, could be in the Andes. It could be in Asia. Because the original idea was all countries will come and join the Union of Republic, Soviet Socialist Republic. So Marxists and capitalists are universalists in the sense that, as Marx said in the Communist Manifesto, the bourgeoisie draws all, even the most barbarian nations, into civilization and creates a world at its own image, a world of bourgeois. And that is not too bad, a world of bourgeois. It's certainly better than a world of mollas and guerrieros and ascetic fanatics and saints. We want a world of, world of bourgeois and, and so on. And Marxist and capitalist libertarians go for the same end game, a classless society, a society where the state withers away, as Engels said at the end of Origin of Family, Property and the State, withers away and belongs to the Museum of Antiquities next to the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. That is the private society, private law society that I was mentioning before. That is a classless society that Marx had in mind. In other words, a society where exploitation no longer exists. But how could you argue if um, you have another movement, a movement that came with a romantic movement in the 19th century, in reaction to the Enlightenment. The Romantic movement was a movement that was against reason, against the dictatorship of science, as they said. A movement that demanded an allegiance to tradition, a loyalty to the tribe, a tribe that you had not chosen, obedience to elders, that was rooted in one place, Ein Reich, Ein Volk, and Führer. There we are. It's the sacred land of our ancestors. My ancestors are buried in that cemetery. How could I betray them? The sacred land, uh, the tradition, the culture are things that are imposed on people and that they have to defend, even if it goes against their interest. You don't compromise with values. You compromise with interest. But how do you compromise with values? How do you betray something that is greater than you? How can you argue against someone who puts king and country before his own life? And the Soviet Union, when the Germans walked in in 1941, realize that, hey, we are just talking about interest. We should be talking about patriotism. The, to this day, they call the 41-45 war the Great Patriotic War. That is what war does. You have to go back to tribes. You have to go back to patriotism. You have to go back to the sacred land and things like that. Because that is the only way that you die, or that you get people to die for you. So the political enlightenment, I mean, that sort of enlightenment, that tradition, lost its first battle on the 31st of July, 1914, at 9 p.m. in Rue Montmartre in Paris. At that moment, Jean Jaurès, 
who was a socialist, who was writing and preaching 31st of July, 1914. We have nothing against the Germans. We have nothing against the German workers. He was shot by Raoul Villain. And a jury acquitted him. The jury acquitted the murderer. Because war, the defense of France, the enemy on the other side of the Rhine, that is more important. How could it be? How could it be more important than life? But that is what happens. So in other words, the 20th century was divided along two frontiers, along two trenches or front lines, a vertical front line, exploiters and exploited, however you define one or the other. And <clears throat> the, um, that was one that was not too dangerous, one that you could negotiate, and we negotiated throughout the 20th century, as I said earlier. And the other one is a horizontal line, a line between nations, a line between tribes, with pre-enlightenment values. And that was not negotiable. That is what led to the slaughters of 1914, the slaughters of 1939, the slaughters that came afterwards. Um, that is the culture war that is such a danger. I mean, I'm passionate about my culture. I believe that French culture is the greatest in the world. But I don't transform it into politics. I don't want to impose it to other people. That is the big difference. So, um, like all libertarians, actually I have no problem with communism, with Islam, and so on. I believe that if people want to practice this, that is fine. In conclusion, and to be practical, I would like to identify um, a few tests, um, offer a few tests of how do we react. Um, one on question of value. Do we believe that a majority can impose their solution on a minority? Is it something that we consider legitimate or not? If you are a collectivist, you say absolutely. The majority has decided, we obey. We bow, we genuflect, and we follow. That is a collectivist mindset. I don't believe that. But the Again, it's just a test, another test. We believe, or many libertarians believe, that we have a right to associate with whomever we want, create the kind of relationship and so on. So, if, and I'm going to take sort of uh, stereotypes, if I want to get to live here, or in France. I want to get my boyfriend from Brazil, or my girlfriend from Russia. Why should I go to a faceless, gray bureaucrat and beg for an authorization for that person to come and live with me? If I want to employ, against stereotypes, if I want to employ an accountant in my business from India, why do I have to go to that same bureaucrat and beg for a work permit for someone that I am recruiting for my business? And if it is one Indian accountant, why not 10? And if I have a big factory, why not 100 
Indian accountants. They want to come, I want to employ them. Who is going to say, unless you are a collectivist, who is going to say you may not? Um, there is a way, actually, of, for people who don't believe in this. Um, there would be a, another test, uh, that is a thought experiment, to give in this country, to give every voter or every individual, every taxpayer, to give them the right to grant a permit, work permit or residential permit, to anyone they wish, or maybe four of these permits, let's say. And they can sell the permits. So you would have businesses who would run ads and say, do you have a permit to sell? I'll, be, I'll buy it for a thousand pounds. Now, it would be interesting in the pub to hear all these people, I believe that we shouldn't have migrants in this country. And you ask them, have you sold a permit recently? That would be an interesting test. Um, another test. Some people say, and Brexiteers, for instance, have had this argument. They say, problem with the European Union is that it add, adds a layer of government. We have our national government, and then on top of that, we have another layer of government in Brussels. That was a big argument. I think it is absolutely correct. The layer that you want to get rid of is a national layer. It's not a Brussels layer. Why? For what I've just said. Because the national layer, king and country, this is our parliament. These are the people you bow to. These are your people you genuflect to. These are the people that have legitimacy. We have had this parliament for 500 years. If you had a local government in Britain, a regional government in Britain, like you have in Wales, and a government in Brussels, that government in Brussels would have very little legitimacy. Would you die for Brussels? Would you go to war for Brussels? No. So what is the greatest danger? And in strategic thinking, or when you play chess, the question to ask all the time is what is the greatest threat? For who, people who believe that individuals have a right to their own lives, to decide their objectives, they have a right not to be in prison, not to be <clears throat> sort of um, coerced in any way. The two greatest dangers today are democracy and the passions that sustain political movements, which is nationalism, tribalism, religion, and so on. Both give legitimacy to the instruments of coercion. So let's make sure that we are fighting the good fight. Thank you. Any questions, contributions, John? You said French culture is best. <laughs> yeah, but I don't and want to impose it. Here. But I don't want to impose it. <laughs> and you live here. Yeah, Why? well, that's right. Why? French well, culture is better. Because I am a cosmopolitan. I am a universalist. And I read French books in French. I speak French with my friends. Some of them are here. I, and then so on. So um, it's not because you want to be, but there is um, a government in France which is very um, repressive not as repressive as you have in Russia, which is itself not as repressive as you have in North Korea, but it's still a government that is repressive. Uh, David, and then Mr. David. Uh, Christian, you, you started your talk uh, by quoting, I think it was Carl Schmitt, yeah. that uh, politics is all about the creation of the enemy. And 
I imagine most people here have read 1984 and we're very familiar with the idea that uh, totalitarianism does indeed thrive on the idea of creating the enemy. But what relevance does any of this have to the world that, that we, fortunate Westerners, live in now? Which on the face of it seems to be a rather benign sort of state where if there is a danger, it is not that it creates enemies, you see, but that it purports to be our friend. That it wants to look after us and, wants to let, and it wants to make our lives nicer and we get ill, that it protects us and so on and, and so forth. Now, there are issues there, but I s struggle at the moment to see how, how the issues that libertarians face when confronting this very nice, friendly, nhs type state have anything to do with the, uh, the denouncements of the enemy and so forth. And, that, and so my question to you is, what is the relevance of your talk to today? Okay. At this very moment, probably, there are British planes that are flying over Syria. They are radars that are monitoring all that is going on around Russia and other places. Um, the MI5 is intercepting communications of thousands of people that are suspected of being terrorists. Isn't that enemies? I doubt that many people uh, on Charlotte Street now would doubt that person. <laughs> no, that is a problem. That is precisely the problem. We don't give a damn because we have integrated oppression. We believe exactly like people did on plantations. The master is good. The master feeds me every day. The master doesn't beat me more than I deserve. So, I think they'd say yeah. that you're exaggerating grossly. And, and that whilst it is, of course, right that you can look at aspects of foreign policy and you can look at aspects of what the security forces do uh, and so forth and, and raise serious questions about it. To suggest that the motivation behind those who run the modern Western state is the creation of enemies would seem to be fighting the battles of 50 or 100 years ago. Look, um, Jacob rees the other day said that um, if we accept the negotiation as it's going and so on, Britain will become a vassal state. Mm -hmm. Now, if that is not thinking of the other, on the other side of the channel, as an enemy who can make you a vassal state, what is the definition of an enemy? Um, uh, I had a similar question to his about the relevance of the genesis of the cultural war in our world today and the exaggerations um, that are implicit uh, even to the examples you take. For example, when you talk about uh, the security guard and the fact that he's not rendering the service, in fact, one might argue that he is rendering the service and that service is making sure that everybody is safe. Um, about, uh, so this is, was um, in the same vibe to what he said earlier. Um, and I had another question about how would you uh, define culture? Interestingly, you said that the French culture is the best, which is something that is picked up. That's right, yes. But what yes, yes. is... Where you feel worse than just. What is the French culture? What, how would you define the French culture? And do you think that definition is only applicable to yourself? Or uh, that's kind of unanimous definition? I have a hard time defining what a culture is and how you should behave and if you want to adhere to a certain culture. OK, I'll answer the second question first. Um, French culture belongs to me. I don't belong to French culture. That's why I cannot impose it to somebody else. That's why I cannot make um, somebody else um, become part of French culture. 
it is something that you take and you make it yours. So um, it's the way you use it. And that is how culture has been used throughout the years, on, except when it becomes politicized, and except when it becomes normalized and defined by some institution. But that is why it changes all the time, because people sort of take it for themselves and make it whatever they want out of it. So the cultures that don't change are the cultures of tribes in Borneo, in uh, the Amazon basin, in very the remotest parts of the world, where these cultures are so fragile that ethnologists don't even want to visit them because the contact with an alien would destroy them. So the robust cultures are the cultures that belong to the people and the people sort of use it the way they want. I have a friend at Oxford who is a scholar and the, what he does is colonial studies in Roman times and what his field of research is looking at texts from people um, in Roman times who were not originally Roman. They came from Gaul, they came from what is now Croatia, from, you know, North Africa, and then so on. So they didn't write in Latin as their first language. But how did they use Latin? The local words, the way they transformed the Latin language is what interests him. Exactly like today, you have colonial studies that look at Nigerian writers in English, Algerian writers in English, Caribbean writers in French, and so on. How they change the language, how they appropriate the French language to make it something different. For me, um, sorry, uh, but it's still not clear. If you say the French culture is something that I took and then I, and that I made my own, what did you do exactly? How would you define it? Also, like I have a hard time seeing that uh, you believe that the French culture is better, solid, yeah. not fragile as, 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 as other culture. That has a judgment of superiority towards other culture. And I feel like... Well, from the French. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you say that the fra like other cultures are fragile, the French culture is not, well, because, like, the example that you took, uh, if, um, if an outsider goes into that culture, then the whole thing doesn't hold. Can't you say the same thing that happened to France? Now you have, during elections, people talking about the French identity, the French culture, Marine Le Pen repeatedly at each event, but no one being able yeah. to say what it is, what makes it, what makes it special, and why uh, the, the new immigrants, or even the old ones who started coming after the Second World War, were a threat. So for me, also the French culture is fragile. It doesn't make it any superior. Yeah, look, we, 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 we can't go on too much on this, but I mean, um, I think it's wonderful that people have taken what we call French culture, or what they call French culture. However they call, I mean, however, what, whatever meaning they put in what they took. And, but they make it theirs. So um, you have people who are, in, in the banlieue as we know, you have people who are using a language that is a mixture of Arabic, of Verlan, of, and so on, and it changes all the time. And it, creeps into uh, high culture. There is no real difference between high culture and low culture, but that's another issue, so we, we can't... <laughs> yes. Uh, we are social animals. Yes. We have to organize. Yes. What's, what's the alternative to democracy? Ah. <laughs> democracy works in, for instance, groups like this, 
corporations, uh, things like that, clubs. Because um, if you no longer want to belong to the club, you send a very polite letter and you say, accept my resignation, and you walk out. So in other words, everybody has signed to the rules of the game. I don't know what nationality you are, but have you French. signed? Okay. <laughs> have, have you signed? I didn't. Uh, the French Constitution. Have you signed that you accept uh, the French way of elections, democracy, things like this? I didn't. I don't think any of the 65 million French people have signed for the rules of the game. It's been imposed on them. So, in other words, it's a way of coercion, exactly in the same way that before democracy they had absolute monarchy, and before absolute monarchy they had, um, I don't know, tribes. And how, how would you organize education in, in the event? Well, look, if we start looking at how a society where people will organize themselves, what it's going to look like, what you are telling me is, um, how do you have a gospel plan? I mean, I'm not the dictator of a new society. The new society will organize itself um, as it is, um, and, uh, you know, has, with, with the technology they will have and things like that. I'm talking the future because Again, in a way, if you, I, I do believe that Marx was right on this, is that history moves um, with technology. Technology changes the forces of production, and uh, new forces of production create new political structures. Now, I believe that the changes in technology, the, in, you know, information revolution, AI, all these good things that we see, you know, emerging today, internet and so on, are making nation states a thing of the past. Nation states, the things that we so believe in, because of wars and so on, nation states that were a creation of the late 18th century, early 19th century. You didn't have nation states before. It's a new creation. And it worked, it had a part to play in the evolution of mankind, but it's now obsolete. And we need to move to some other form of organization, which I think will be a libertarian society, a private law society. Right now, we have all these populist movements that yes. are the counter-revolution. The counter-revolution exactly like after the French Revolution, the 18th century, the Enlightenment, and so on, as we were saying earlier, you had the Romantic movement. You had Metternich, you had the backlash, you had all these, you know, decabrists in Russia and all these sort of things. So you had that, it lasted 20, 25 years. And then the movement continued. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm always agree with you guys about the relevance. I wouldn't say so much the relevance. Um, of what you were saying. It was that uh, what you inadvertently were doing for me was you, um, you didn't mean to, was you showed the value of democracy, which is the prevailing system in the developed world. You were advancing for an awful lot of time the uh, some kind of libertarian utopia, which doesn't exist any more than socialist utopias and uh, you know fascist utopias and religious utopias. Um, and to some extent, that's why we have democracy. What democracy is, it's a system in which conflicting visions of how uh, the state should be run and society should be organized compete for control uh, of the state uh, and, so, and, and control of social organization. And they tend to alternate. Um, and they, and precisely it's the opposite of what you said, yes, in this conflict, in the political conflict, the other side, of course, are complete bastards. But they are not the enemy. 
in democracy, you accept that the other side is going to gain control. And this is fundamental to democracy. And you get worried when that system breaks down. And when somebody starts to come in, and you know, where obviously when you, play, when you get a Hitler, and we have tendencies in the odd uh, countries towards that, uh, I don't think Trump is anywhere near that, but you know, you have, is it Hungary? I don't, I don't know about that at all. I mean, but there clearly are t constant tendencies, and Putin is not a, you don't have a true democracy there, and so on. That's when it gets bad. That's when it breaks down. But on the whole, it doesn't break down. It's remarkable that people are tolerant of each other. Um, and that you, for me, in a, you didn't mean to, you asserted the value of that. And I was, you know, personally, as I said, we, we discussed recently, I was more interested personally in, in what's immediately going on is this strange, but this is a sort of recent phenomenon where uh, people, uh, where the conflicting sides, there is this tendency recently for the conflicting sides to villainize the other side. You know, this was extraordinary how the <coughs> Brexit and Remainers got at each other and considered each other, you know, the, the, uh, 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 the level of abuse was, was extreme. And it's also, you get that in America between Republicans. And that's a, a recent phenomenon. But the, um, and that's how I'm interested in. Why has suddenly it got so extreme? And that's dangerous. But in general, yes, we have functioning, robust demo democracies. OK, you have, what you have is uh, democracy is simply a system to say who is going to govern. We tend to believe that because we have had democracy in the Western world, um, that democracies are liberal democracies. But liberalism is something completely different. Liberalism in the classical sense is a system of rights. Liberalism doesn't tell you who governs. Liberalism tells you what are the limitations on the power of whoever governs. Whoever governs, however they got there, are limited because they have to accept freedom of press, freedom of association, freedom of movement, freedom of enterprise. They have to accept that individuals have rights. They have a right to due process of law. They have rights to all these sort of things. And the government is constrained by the rule of law. That is what liberalism is. Now, instead of preaching this, after 1989, we went trumpeting around the world and saying, you have to have democracies, guy. So people said, oh, democracy, yeah. We have to have elections. And whoever wins, whoever has 51%, rules. And so you had these people in Egypt, Sisi, in, and, and before. You had these people in Algeria. You have these people in Russia. You have these people in Poland and all these countries who say, Hey, we have elections, and we have 51%, and therefore we decide. So the, what is important in this, what is important is liberalism. It's not democracy. Now, the reason, as you rightly point out, that we have these illiberal democracies is precisely that the system is breaking down. In other words, what for us was conflated, what for us was the same one and same thing, liberalism and democracy. And because people on the left don't like the word liberalism because they think it's capitalism, they think it's all these bad things. So they tend to use the word democracy to say the things we like. You know, uh, the teacher is democratic. Uh, what they mean is that he's a nice teacher, he's a nice bloke. Uh, something is anti-democratic, what they mean is that they don't like it. But the system is breaking down because the world is moving towards another moment in its history when people are getting more and more disappointed that the government cannot deliver. 
and the government cannot deliver precisely because we are past the time in history of nation states. That's possible, but you can still have a multinational democracy, and democracy can evolve. Your premise was that, democ uh, was that governments create enemies. Now, the, one didn't, the other guys didn't buy it. I didn't well, buy it. governments create enemies because precisely you have the opposition. No, fan, and the opposition. fascists, when you get a non-democracy, -democ when the democracy is perverted, uh, which can happen, which can really break down, and we don't have real breakdowns in most cases. Um, that's when you get enemies, and when you get people, sorry, being okay. victimized. Okay, well. So the Northern speech, I have to tell you, just so you get, and it's just too worn now. Uh, the chap at the back, Jan, and then this chap here, and then this lady here, and then this lady here. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's the Northern speech, uh, sorry about all that. <laughs> chap at the back first. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I came late. Uh, I only saw the uh, title of this uh, event over an hour ago, so I hopped it on the, on the tube all the way from England to get here. Oh, thank you. I was, I was, taking, I, I was, was tempted to come along because of the title uh, as it was discussing the culture wars. And while the speaker speaks with great eloquence about the, the virtues of liberalism, I do feel as if we're not really touching on what I felt was to be the subject matter of the talk, which was the culture wars. And the culture wars, as I, as I, as I see them and experience them as somebody who uses the internet every day, is to simplify it, the sort of arguments that was had over the American election between the followers of Trump and the followers of Hillary Clinton or George Bush and, uh, and Dukakis uh, 20, 25 years ago. Um, I feel, so far I don't feel as if the uh, question or the speaker have really addressed that, but rather instead talked about sort of rather, rather lofty uh, ideals of the application of liberalism. I would be interested to hear what the speaker has to say about the issues of the sort of of the so-called culture wars, or as I like to think of the value wars, because I think what we're talking about actually are two different and conflicting views of uh, how to perceive and describe, negotiate, uh, and communicate our views and our values uh, to each other, and the failures that have been developing in that for the last 15 years, largely because I think the internet has allowed people to spend almost all of their time only talking to people who rather tend to think along the same lines that they do, never needing to hear an alternative view, never needing to even meet somebody who has a different philosophical uh, viewpoint. So I'd be interested to hear the speaker's uh, views on that, but, but simply because when you put the word culture wars into the title of the talk, I think in 2018 that's what people are expecting to hear about. Yeah, but I was talking about Cold War as well, so in the same title. So in other words, I was opposing both. And culture war, I'm taking it in a deep sense of uh, nationalism, tribalism, what creates, what binds people together, and that they translate into a political form. Things that bind people together, religion, things like that, are perfect. I mean, you know, this is what we are. We are social animals, as uh, Andre was saying earlier. Um, we don't live as isolated monads uh, in an ocean. Uh, <clears throat> so we relate to other people. But the problem is when we transfer, when we um, convey our culture through political means, and therefore we want to impose this culture, these norms, this religion, these whatever it is, uh, on the lives of other people. Uh, homosexuality is bad, it's in the scriptures. I believe in the scriptures, therefore I put you in jail. So, why? I mean, believe the scriptures are right, and therefore you don't practice homosexuality. Fine. But why impose it? Why impose that prohibition on other people? Now, on the question of silos, that you, you know, people are in echo chambers and so on, I find it quite extraordinary. I mean, I know a lot of, most of my friends read The Guardian. I don't see them buying Daily Mail. Uh, a lot of people um, read the same newspaper, watch the same programs, um, and they have been doing this for the last 200 years. They buy their newspaper with their views, uh, which conform, conform, comforts them in being uh, Conservatives, Labour, Socialist, 
whatever. So um, it's very f there are very few people who go, I do that because I enjoy it, but uh, who go to meetings with people who don't think like they do. Is that what you wanted to hear? No. Mm, not really. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I've actually come to the meeting. I'm not sure I consider myself a libertarian, but here I am putting it into practice. That's good. That's good. But you, you got the wrong meeting, so that I, no, it's, no, not, no. it's not convincing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that must be a foreign topic, though. So it just didn't. You did talk about it a bit before it came, didn't you? These yeah, yeah, that's but, exactly. So. Dan? You said there wouldn't be countries if there weren't states. Mm. Uh, well, for one thing, uh, England is recognised as a country and it shares a state with Scotland and Northern Ireland and Wales. Mm. But for another, if in England we were to get rid of the state, which in this country, of course, is not at its heart a democracy, but a popularly elected oligarchy, no kind of democracy at all. The, the whole idea of representative democracy makes as much sense as uh, saying a slave has representative self-ownership. We don't have democracy, and we shouldn't, because it would be even worse than elected oligarchy. Yeah. However, if we were to get rid of that and simply have a free society, there would still be an England, because there will always be an England. <laughs> <laughs> and that's fine. I'm, I have no problem with that. So, um, and, and it will be your England, and it will be, you know, his England, and her England, and, and so on. So, because we all have, or you all have, and I have, a very different view of England. So, um, my view is informed by Trafalgar, by... Uh, <laughs> or Jonathan. 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 <laughs> Henry V... Yeah, yeah well, so right. Right. Uh, and, and Hastings. <laughs> oh, no, Hastings. Uh, you, you keep mentioning things where the French win, so you don't. <laughs> yeah, forget all those. Yeah, exactly. Merci. Chacun a son coup. Thank you for the talk. I was reading my paper the other day, and I came across a whole section on a new way by which countries are governed. It's called managerialism, mm. which I believe, from what I can remember, is that the state offers something that looks like democracy, smells like democracy, but isn't, but uh, allows populist movements or populist ideas to be the main thread of the government of that entity, which I give a name to. So that it, it's almost a fascist state, but giving pop, giving a uh, popular lead to various policies that, that make the state seem soft. Mm. So, and this is the oncoming thing that, that happened a lot in the, uh, um, the, the Commonwealth of Independent States, uh, the, the Russian states, as it were, that, that nothing, not, everything looks perfect and lovely, but it isn't really. Mm. Just that appearance that's dressed up. Yeah, in some instances, um, you could say, thank God for the deep state. Thank God for the bureaucracy that um, curtails and castrates the idiocies of the electorate. So um, I think that there is a lot to be said for this counter power, this um, balance, in a way, in a way when uh, you have um, all sorts of you know, crazy individuals who vote for crazy um, elected uh, presidents or whatever, uh, and at least you have a stabilizer, which is that bureaucracy. Now, ideally, we would have none. We wouldn't have a bureaucracy and we wouldn't have the elected crazy whoever who are running the country they might be running their association, their non-governmental organization, their corporations, their church or whatever. But so they would be 
the, limit, the damage they would be doing would be limited to people who follow them. Church of Scientology, or whatever it is. Um, but at least you have a stabilizer when they get elected in a country, which doesn't exist in Hungary, in places like this, because um, they don't have a tradition of a civil service. Uh, they, uh, and they don't have the culture of liberalism. They never had liberalism. They went from the Austro-Hungarian Empire to Orti and his sort of fascistoid government to the Soviets. They never had a tradition of liberalism as we have in Western Europe. Yeah. First of all, I would like to uh, apologize as well because uh, uh, I did a worse uh, for better, I'm not sure, but this gentleman over there, not only I came late, uh, but I let the door slam behind me and uh, I managed to make people move to get a seat. So, sorry about that. That's very bad. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Just a coincidence, actually. <laughs> So uh, my question, uh, Christian, was uh, you said that actually there is a, a trend at the moment that uh, the nation, uh, uh, the states are disappearing, nationalism is developing towards something new. Um, I would be interested to uh, have your take on, actually it seems that, uh, you know, there is actually a, a, a nationalistic uh, surge, uh, it already happened like this uh, gentleman mentioned, in Hungary, uh, in Poland, uh, the Brexit towards shows a surge of nationalism. Uh, Trump, to some extent, when he says America first, is a nationalist. So I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, do you think that this nationalist surge is a sort of necessary step towards what is, what is happening next, and that will somehow show that nationalist uh, uh, state or, or government are just not capable anymore of handling the situation, or something else, but I just would like to hear how you believe that what is happening now, which is a nationalist sir, can, you know, in this change, make something hopefully better, which is the better than is more any other liberal state? Yes, I think it's a good question. I think that what, what is happening today, as I mentioned earlier, is a counter-revolution. So you had in the 1970s, especially 80s, 90s, and so on, you had that big movement of globalization, the internet, problems that were becoming problems at the um, <clears throat> at the world level: pandemics, terrorism, criminality, um, global warming, however important you believe it is, and so on. But certainly the environment. Um, all these things can no longer be dealt with at the level of governance because they are completely making a mockery of frontier borders and so on. Massive migra migrations, all these sort of things are telling us a national government with its little sort of borders or big borders, Russia, United States and so on, um, they can't do it. They try to sit together, they try to have G7, they try to have organization, United Nations, things like that, it doesn't work. So people are getting frustrated because they say, we elect you, we pay taxes, you don't solve the problems. Well, they can't solve the problems because either the problem is much larger than what a government may do, or it's a problem at a very local level. And it should be the, an issue for the government to deal with. It's a you know, problem of bicycle thefts, a problem of people putting their soil shoes on uh, the seat above them, uh, in front of them, in, in a train, and things like that. And they say, we must be a law against that. A law against that. I mean, you know, so <clears throat> you have, and but because governments, elected governments, know that they don't have any impact on the things that really matter, unemployment, all these sort of things, because it doesn't depend on them. It depends on what's happening in China, what's happening in America, what's happening with this corporation, that corporation. Because they cannot control all this, they justify what they are doing by legislating the only thing where they have an impact. So they legislate about the size of windows. They legislate about how much you can heat your 
or you know, flat in winter, the legislate about what kind of cloth you can put on this and so on. Because hey, you have to justify what you are doing. I mean, Gladstone was not legislating about you know, sort of things like that. He was running an empire. Now you no longer run empires. So um, it's a situation that is very, and people realize this. So what you have is a backlash against history, because I believe that it is history. I believe that <clears throat> it is this movement. David disagrees, but I believe that you know, all these technologies and so on are bringing us to another point of history, which is exactly like um, you left kings and multinational empires, the Habsburg Empire, the Russian Empire, the, and so on, um, which broke apart nation states. Now we move beyond nation states. And um, the sooner the better, but that counter revolution is going to put the clock back for 10, 15 years before we can move on to a more globalized world, a world where that tribal attachment we have to the soil, to um, a uh, sort of wrong idea of a culture, um, will dissipate because younger generations that are, bought, that are brought up in another environment will say, really believe in that. Well, why do clock back? Uh, uh, this, this, this is your speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, I've read the text. Did you speak? I, I, I have spoken. Thank you. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm I think it is oh, Faye over there. there. Yes. Yeah. Faye. Yes. I think some of your ideas might be more appropriate for small villages. But a lot of people live in very complex urban societies. And in those societies, you need institutions like the National Health, you need institutions. If we didn't have you know, traffic regulations, there would be chaos in the road. There would be you know, huge amounts of people, there would be all kinds of things that are much worse than we are today. So I think people who, who buy into these very big societies actually aggregate some of their own individual rights in that sense, so that when you say, you, you complain about this grey bureaucrat, faceless bureaucrat asking you to open your suitcase, people comply with that because there's a greater good idea of a complex society. So, you know, if this policeman stopped me and said, I want to search your car, or your lights aren't working, or this and that, I might find it annoying, or I might find it personally invasive, but I accept it because I don't want cars out there that could, you know, break down, that could cause accidents that are dangerous, that pollute the place. So, in a way, everyone gives up a little in order to gain in a society, have a national health service, have an education service. If we didn't have that, then there wouldn't be a communal language in schools. There wouldn't be some, you know, there wouldn't be a, any kind of communal or cohesive. Um, something that we all participate in. And so I think it's, it's something that people give up. And, and also, I think some of your language demonized and, um, people. And um, also, a kind of, it was, it was as if you're, you're assuming that they have a certain kind of thought and belief that I don't think you can. I mean, for instance, just to say, when you said, if we speak of a teacher as being democratic, we think of him as good and undemocratic as bad. Well, you know, it's almost like Orwell's, you know, four legs are good, two legs are bad. It's very reductionist. It doesn't, I don't know anyone who would, who would use that kind of language or make those kind of assumptions. Um, I don't, I don't think it's, it's that, you know, basic. It's, it's, you know, people don't, um, you know, some of your concepts, you seem to be, like this concept of the enemy. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily think that someone who opposes me politically or in social ideas, I wouldn't see them as an enemy. I would see them as someone who has different views from me and in a democracy can, has as much right to air the views as I have to air my views. But I wouldn't designate these people as enemies. 
And I think that's projecting rather than, you know, actually defining how people actually feel. I, I'm sure there are people who might feel like that, but I don't think there's a kind of generic template of, of hostility in that way or, or defining the other in that way. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> you have people, for instance, <clears throat> who were vehemently opposed to the Iraq war, just to take one big event like this. Yet, they paid for it, they uh, had to support it, couldn't do anything against it. Well, they didn't have to support it. They, they, they had no, no, to support it. No, they had to support it. it. Yeah, no, but they had... Uh, the thing is, the reason I don't vote, and I've not voted since 1974 in a political election, is that I don't want to put, to cast a ballot, to say, this is how I want others to live. I don't believe that I have a right to tell others that they have to support a socialist government or they have to support a conservative government. I don't, why would I do that? And therefore, I don't believe that a socialist government, a conservative government, a whatever government, has any legitimate authority against me. Now, if you participate in a vote, it's like if you sit down at a poker table, you play the game and you lose. And you can't complain. You accepted the game. You were in 1932, oh, no. you voted in the election, Hitler got elected, that's what you wanted. You may have voted completely differently, but you played the game and you cannot, after having played the game, say, oh, I don't like the outcome. No. So <clears throat> people who voted for whatever government declared the war and whatever war, 1939, Iraq, whatever, they got what they wanted. They participated in a game. The outcome is not what they wanted. But they played the game. And if that is not creating an enemy, I mean, after all, you know, <clears throat> thousands of troops we are sent to bomb people in Iraq, to invade Iraq, to shoot whatever it was who was opposing them, and Afghanistan. If that is not creating an enemy, what is? And we've got a couple of Arab speakers, so I don't know whether they can get them all in. Pat, yeah. first of all, be very brief, Pat, if yeah, you can. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, <laughs> you can. I agree with what you were saying about the state. Um, it's a pity most people don't realise how sort of, sort of subversive it is and underhand. Is. Um, for for a, simple, a simple example, um, this very meeting here, if you lived in Tower Hamlets and you were on the library website, you, you'd never know about this meeting because it's... Uh, the libertarian stuff and censored. Anything to do with liberty is censored. Yeah, they used to censor a lot of articles in the Sun as well. Uh, I, I believe they still do. But certainly, this very meeting here is censored. You'd have to go outside the borough and, and, and use access another uh, library. But, I mean, but, but that's, I mean, Tower Hamlets, it's got a long history of kind of quasi religious sort of you know, politics. Um, but there is a great da danger in the state, yeah, and I think it's getting worse, actually, a lot worse. Um, you, but the need for the state, the, the, there's no doubt that in the technological world where a lot of our, a lot of the cities are paved over, I mean, you couldn't grow anything if, if you had to. Uh, you're so reliant on people, and there's a big difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics. You need, um, you need a, a, an elite, if you want, if you want a better word, to produce money, to generate money. Uh, I mean, literally, physically, to, to make money and, and to control it. And yes, they had an elite, and, and they got this civil service um, uh, qualities which you were talking about. But I suspect that right at this moment, that you, you do need that kind of thing. But um, it is... Uh, necessary, you know, these necessary evils that go with the state. Um, just another thing I just want to mention, I mean, ISIS 
uh, took all the parts of Iran. And that's what a lot of the trouble, and Syria as well, that's what a lot of the trouble about was about. If we had a lib your libertarian society here in England, they wouldn't need to start up in Iraq. They would just simply come here, place without borders, <laughs> with their weapons, start ordering the people about, and they'd, they'd have a, a ready-made society for them uh, here. Because there's, there'd be no opposition to them whatsoever. Uh, you have to take into mind that there are a lot of people out there, societies, organizations, with one thing in mind, and that is to destroy the idea of liberty and libertarianism. They just want to destroy it. Whenever it's for religious reasons or PC reasons, it could even be for health oh, reasons. Keep, 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 but, for, many, for many different reasons. <laughs> but have you taken that on board? Yeah. We've got we 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 yes. I think there are many, many people who still wonder. Somebody in the back there, no? You didn't want to I think there was somebody in the back. Um, <laughs> oh, she. Yeah. Uh, Tom, this chap, and then, uh, and then this guy in here. And when... So, 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 Tom, so could you... Sure, sure, I'll be very brief. Uh, I just was... So, sorry to make some very, uh, sense as you're, you're talking. Uh, and you talked about giving your life for a country. Mm. Um, I don't know if this is true, but uh, I think it is that no two democracies have ever gone to war. Oh, I, 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 well, well, it's very rare if, if not. What about, what about 1914? Well, you're not trying to throw you. So that's, that's, I, I'd like to, to wonder whether that's... I think democracies are inherently peaceful with other democracies, is one thing. Uh, in terms of morals, uh, I think it's moral to enforce our views. Like, I really do think a slave state like North Korea should be sorted out. I think we should free those people. They are living under a regime of hell, and, and we should help them people. I don't care about the government, I just care about the people. I think that's something we should do. Um, I do think we should do that. Um, uh, and I think that last point, I've got other points, but this is the last one. So you talk about corporations potentially becoming, uh, uh, you could leave a corporation, but what stops a corporation becoming so large? It's effectively a state. It starts buying land, and, and before you know it, a corporation owns the whole of London and the whole of South England, and it's a, essentially a state and starts guarding its borders. What prevents that from happening? Other corporations? Yeah, but, but I own this. It, property, the, you know, ownership of property is, is fundamental to libertarian thinking, isn't it? I own it. Yeah. You don't. And, and you go bust, and therefore it goes into other hands. This is what happened, you know, think of all the uh, foundries, uh, the shipyards, the, uh, you know, big factories all around London that have now been developed into residential, into whatever, something else. So, um, yeah, property is your property so long as you can keep it. Um, if you cannot run the business, uh, goes bust, goes to the other hands. There are many scenarios where you can think that a corporation could maintain that dominance. Say, for instance, the French wine industry, you could, you could start growing, you could start dominating that and own all of the French wine. And there's no way to, you know, everyone Fantasy. wants it. And yeah, but it, it's, only, it's impossible to take it away from them. Well, and so they're effectively a state. Okay. Ah. <laughs> that's, that's what I touched State on. State with all the wine. Yeah. 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 It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. That's what I touched on. What's your view to you that's indifference to politics, right? Now? Is it something good? What, what's your view? Because after the Brexit, you come out and say, because a lot of us didn't vote. And that's when one of the reasons that's why Brexit happened. So that's a lot. You, you can see there's some movement there that's you trying to encourage a lot of the appeal to come out and vote. A, and of course, there's another side that say uh, we have to participate in politics because that's uh, because we want some social change. For example, if for example, I'm, I'm a cyclist. And if let's say I don't participate in, in, in voting someone who can speak on behalf of me to have more cycling lane, for example, 
and it, then I won't have cycling lane that I can see in London today. That's why there's some kind of political uh, engagement has to be there to have a kind of social engagement. So probably it's, it's two questions, maybe it's interrelated as well. So the youth indifference and to participate for uh, uh, politics as one of the tools for, uh, for social change. Yeah, I think that they are two different things. I mean, cycle lanes and many other issues are managerial issues, to use the, the word that... Uh, um, so, uh, yes, you, you have a management of the City of London or boroughs in London or whatever it is organised and so on and, and, you know, in other places. And then whoever runs this management uh, can be elected, can be drawn by lot, can be uh, selected by heredity or uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, they, if they are not very good managers, uh, you will move to another borough or you will do something different, uh, stop, whatever. Um, but what is the political side is not that they are simply managing cycle lanes or <laughs> gardens or things like this. It is that they can impose things on you, which go all the way to conscripting you into an army, goes all the way into confiscating 30% of your income, 50% of your income, goes all the way into debasing your savings, because an inept management of a currency means that the currency is devalued by 30%, 40%, and your purchasing power has disappeared, or there is high inflation, or there is all these sort of things are what political governments do. Now, the idea is, uh, oh, okay, they are elected for five years, but if you don't like it, if people don't like it, we will change in five years. Now, two things. One, in five years, they can cause a lot of harm, including wars, including devaluation, including all these sort of things. But, or irre irreversible changes. In other words, uh, they decide that we should move to a nuclear power-based uh, grid or things like that. That is irreversible for 50 years, um, or, or not. Um, the other thing is that bizarre idea that, OK, they will hit you for five years, but hey, you will have your revenge in five years. You can hit them back. I mean, this is like kids in a playground. You know, if you don't hit them now, they will hit you. So go and, ta don't go and hit them. Uh, come on, can't we be adults? And can't we say, look, nobody is hitting anybody. If you want to live like this, if you want to be socialist, communist, share equally your income, give up your inheritance, uh, put in common your means of production that socialists do, communists do, please, be my guest. I have no problem with that. If you want to be devout Catholic, you sign a marriage contract, it's not going to be dissolved, you can't divorce because that is what you wanted, you will live by that. If you want to be something else, live by what you want. We are not going to tell you how to live. It's very important that people live in communities because we are social animals. We can only flourish if we live in a community. But we can only flourish if we live in a community that we choose and that chooses us. So um, not something where they impose a lifestyle on us. As people have done, majorities have done, democracies have done. I mean, homosexuality was illegal and criminal until the 1960s in this country. People got, went to jail for being homosexuals. Why? Why? So, very last. Um, I had a couple of uh, notes. Um, I understand the frustration 
uh, of having to abide by rules that you didn't change, but I, uh, that you didn't choose, and you didn't choose to elect the people who set those rules, but is choosing to not vote the solution for that, I, I, I don't feel so, because you will abide by those rules in any case, and if all of us start at one moment to stop voting, then we will all have rules that we are with, then we don't, uh, that we didn't choose. And also economically speaking, so ideal, uh, ideally it could work economically speaking. I have a hard time uh, imagining this working out uh, now when you have capital moving all from all um, different parts of the world, when you have restrictions, when you have a flux of um, goods, materials, uh, money pouring in. It's in, just incredible, the economical exchanges that, ha that happen between countries. How can that be still work out if we are very atomic? Um, you know, a lot of um, states uh, Who told me to in yeah, this okay. last question? <laughs> okay. A lot of regions had this idea, um, Catalonia, uh, we're talking now about Cal California exit, and economists have done their studies, have done their homework, and it's always, the results that you find is that the separation will be harmful for both parties both for Catalonia and the rest of Spain, for California and the rest of the, uh, of, of the United States. Um, last note is one of the ideas that you had uh, when answering to this lady over here is that um, the, the system here or our government has failed. Um, I'm wondering if it's uh, a systematic fail or, or if the government sometimes wants to fail, uh, which sounds a bit uh, conspiracyist, but let's take the US. Well, where is this going to end? <laughs> one last note. Um, in the US now, right now, the situation with the immigrants uh, and the children taken away from, from their parents, I don't know if you are aware of it, and, and the Attorney General who cited Romans 13 uh, to, defend their, to defend his case, but this could be done, but no one wants to solve immigration. No one wants the system to succeed, because otherwise, what else would they have in the next elections? I mean, there are many different issues in, in, in what you said, and I don't know how to uh, start or <laughs> where to start and, uh, and, and so on. I think that the question of you know, um, countries uh, breaking up is um, something that is um, a kind of absurdity in the sense that um, if, if you have countries that are breaking up and simply keeping everything open, it would be like Manchester not being Birmingham. Uh, yeah, management of Manchester, management of Birmingham, but everything flows between Manchester and Birmingham and Birmingham, Liverpool, and things like this. If it is that, which, for instance, would have been the idea of the European Union or something like that, that is fine. In other words, you can have as many countries as you want. But you have to have something on top that says you have to keep things flowing. And this is precisely, you have many libertarians who say, oh, if we could break up all these countries, then if you have a government that is oppressive, you simply move to the next country. Well, think about it. You have around the world millions and millions of people who are living under governments that are not only oppressive, they are killing their citizens. They are impoverishing their citizens. And what we do is, oh, we are not coming here. So it's only if you have a kind of super organization, which I'm not advocating, but you know, to continue that logic, if you have a super organization 
that can guarantee the free movement of capital, money, people, ideas, and so on, that this idea of having a multiplicity of governments is workable and a good thing. Otherwise, if you hate countries, states, why do you want to have more of them? It's like François Mauriac was, you know, at the time of um, uh, reunification of Germany, what well, before, um, died. You know, but he was saying, you know, I love Germany so much, but I'm happy that there are two Germanys. So, in other words, they, it was a way of weakening Germany. So, no, I think that the, the idea is if we are moving towards a world where people can flourish however they want to live, whoever they want to associate with, and so on, I think we have to move past this idea of states, nation states, and things like this. What it will be, it's difficult to tell. But what could you have said of modern democracy in 1500? What could you have said of Europe in 1800? Things move in unpredictable way. The, uni the Soviet Union was inconceivable in 1850. 100 years later, it was a hyperpower that everybody feared. So the way that things move is simply behind our imagination. The only thing I can say is that it moves. Yes, thank you, Richard.